Jack Taylor was buried yesterday. You've got to remember him. He's been with us probably more than any other person from a children's home. For years and years he's come here. And uh, I remember when they hired somebody else and started separating the territories and they were going to give our church to a lady from a children's home. I'm sorry I forgot her name, but her dad was a pastor for 50, 60 years in East Tennessee. And Jack threw a fit. He said, no, she's not getting West End. <laughs> and so that it went all the way to the CEOs of the children's home. Jack ended up back with us I remember one of the last times he was with us, he said, my wife's not with me today because they took my, our son to the hospital in Cookville. Well, Monday, Jack called that Monday and said, my son didn't make it in his 40s, I think. And then this week, Brother Glenn texted me and said, Brother Jack was really, really sick. He passed away, and then yesterday I received, or Friday received a text that they was having his funeral at the Cookville Church. You will not believe, I know it'll be out pretty soon in the Echo and uh, the paper that we get, the money that Brother Jack has raised for the children's home. It's, it's in the, if not millions, it's in the, upper thousands that that man has raised across Tennessee. They're going to miss him. And uh, he was dedicated to his work. Uh, so remember, I'm not sure if his wife is still alive or not. Uh, I don't remember hearing one way or the other, but they had his funeral in the Cookville Free Will Baptist Church and yesterday, and I'm sure it was full. I wish I'd have been able physically to go, but I was just afraid to try. But uh, my prayers were with them. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 58. I'm going to end. I'm going to start with that verse and end with that verse and just five things that I want to share with you. I haven't heard whether Teresa's aunt passed or not. She told me Wednesday night. She left here crying and said she was headed back to North Carolina early Thursday morning. And she said, I'll call you if anything happens. And I haven't heard. So don't know if she's still alive or, or not. But remember that family when you pray. Some of you know uh, Porter Roach. I buried Senior Porter uh, several years ago, and then uh, Marlette just told us this morning that Porter Roach Jr.'s son, Mark, passed away. Some of you might know him. You know, Mark was his brother. So Porter Mark Jr. what? What's Porter Jr.'s brother? Huh? What's Porter Jr.'s brother? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, it's the brother. Okay. So we remember them. And I, I know that uh, Alan used to come here, joined, and was a member, and he's a brother also. So several of those boys have died in the past two or three years. And uh, it's, it's, I understand that it's uh, genetic problems, so please remember them. Okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, I have read this verse I don't know how many times in graveyards. I don't know how many funerals that I preach, but I've got a book and I put the bulletins and some have been so poor there wasn't a bulletin printed, but I've made notes and put in there. Now, I don't know how many weddings, but I've kept that up too. But I've done probably two funerals to every wedding or maybe three. And in the next month, I'll have two weddings. So pray for me as I travel for one. I don't know exactly. I just know it's somewhere between Madison and Gallatin. One of the nurses, it'll be at her home where I'm doing rehab. And it's uh, one of her best friends that they're doing the wedding there. She said she wanted a short wedding. And I said, I can do that. I said, you're not like the one guy said, you don't understand, I want a real short wedding. We're going to give you $1,000 to do this wedding, but every word you say, we're going to take away $100. <laughs> so I looked at her and pointed at him and said, want them? and looked at him and pointed at her and said, want him? Got him. <laughs> that was one of the shortest weddings I can ever remember. That didn't really happen. Folks, it's looking on TV, I'll get something started here in a minute. Uh, or computer. But uh, I want to talk to you about five things that Christ left the church to help us labor for Him. But this is one of the best verses to start it out. 1 Corinthians 15.53 says this. When I get on the right page. Let's start with 1553. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength, strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the text. I said 53, it's 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting here today. 
And you tell us where two or three are gathered that you'll be there. And Lord, you preach to twelve. And one of them was a, de a devil. That's your words. And I pray, Father, that you will bless us today and be with these, Lord, that's waiting on their loved ones to pass from this world to the next. Be with Marlette's family. Be with the Roach family. And Lord, I pray that you will be with those that are traveling and help us today to turn our attention away from all the problems that are here in this world and to turn them to you. Help us now to preach with power and authority from your book. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think with me when he tells us for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I know we all have labored at different things and got through and backed up and looked at it and said, after all I've done, it don't look right or it's not going to work. And we've had to tear it down and start all over again. We labor here and things go wrong. But I want to share these five things that will go right if we do the labor that the Lord has called us to do. First of all, I want us to see verse 1. Unfinished task. The Lord Jesus Christ has left us an unfinished task. Jesus took many things back to heaven, but He left us a great work to do. And He left us with power to do it. And I want us to think about it. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. That's verse 1 of chapter 15. And so he left us an unfinished work, seeing the lost for his name, or seeking the lost for his name. That's found in verse 14. Listen to what he says. He says, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. And he's simply telling us if Christ didn't tell us the truth, we're wasting our time. If the Bible's not true, we're wasting our time. But I tell you today that the Bible is true. Every word of it. Spend our means getting out the gospel. We are not wasting our money when we put it in an offering plate. We're not wasting our time when we come to church. It's no time wasted. The Lord takes a note of who comes and who is faithful. And I assure you that the Bible teaches rewards will be handed out in heaven not for the work that you do, for nobody's saved by works, but your reward will be handed to you for your faithfulness. And we need to remember that. And it's an unfinished business. We still need to go and bring people in. We still need to invite people to come. The Word of God says at the end there will be a great falling away and people will become lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And if you can't see that today, you're blind. People love pleasure more than they love God. And it's a fact. I am not against 
uh, people camping. I'm not against them having a good time with their family. But they don't have to be a holiday for them to do it. You can drop your hat and because something different, they have an excuse to go camping. Preacher Hollifield used to say, I hate to come to church on a holiday because I can just watch the campers and the boats and the RVs go right past the church. And he said, I'm thinking, does church not matter anymore? Does God not come in the picture anymore? But we can't do anything about it. It's Bible. At the end time, there'll be a great falling away from the Word of God, from the churches, from the truth. And they'll go to mega churches where they have preachers with itching ears. Telling everybody what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. But yet, he tells us to be steadfast, unmovable. Every man will stand on his own ground, on his own feet, in his own judgment. We're not judged for anybody else. Thank God for that. And then we see that we are to send missionaries out. I remember two or three things about being in the hospital for 46 days. There's some weeks that I don't remember. I can remember waking up three times on life support. And I can remember just some people coming and I can't remember the conversation, but I know this. I know that there are things that's unchanging. And that's one of them. One day, we'll all wake up in glory, I hope and pray. One day, the last breath here will be the first breath over there. But there's so many people that don't know the Lord. There's so many people that they just think it's part of life is being born and living and dying and it's over. Folks, that's just the beginning. They're looking at it wrong. The second thing that I want you to see after the first one is he's left us an unfinished task. That's the first one. And I thought last night as I got a text from Michigan from one of my nieces that uh, I was told that she come to the hospital to see me and I barely, barely remember. But she sent a picture and she said, I just went to the store and bought a dress to wear to church when we come down to visit you in October. In October, right now, it's planned a family reunion. There'll be people Derek's never met. There'll be people I've never met, but they're my family. And there'll be people that Regina's never met. And I'm looking forward to them coming. But my friend, when we get to heaven, there'll be people we've never met. Family. When we get there. For the Bible teaches us that this book is, number two, an unchallenged message. It's infallible. It is true from Genesis to Revelation. Even the cover is true because it says Holy Bible. And we need to realize that today. It's unchallenged because it's almost like seeing a Goliath and the whole Israelite army afraid to go against him. He was unchallengeable, except when a shepherd boy come 
because he knew God and he knew there was no power on earth greater than God. And my friend, it's the same way today. There's no power on earth greater than the power that's in this book. And we need to remember that today. It's unchallengeable. You cannot prove it's wrong. Everybody that I've ever heard that set out to prove the Bible's wrong has ended up getting right with God because it's quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword and it will bring tears to your eyes. It will soften a hard heart. It will fix your problems. That's the kind of book this is. And we see that He is the Son of God. Not even angels can explain the power that Jesus has. You know the story of Michael, the archangel? You know the story of the warrior angel? You know the story of the angel just flying over Sennacherib's army that slew 185,000 foot soldiers? just by flying over them? One angel. Can you imagine the Lord on the cross when they said, come down if you're the Son of God. And I have read and heard preach and Jesus said he could call legions of angels to come. And if one angel can do that much damage, Think what a legion of angels could do to this world just by passing over. But Jesus just has to speak and it's done. We cannot comprehend that kind of power. And then we see that the sacrifice for sin, no, no, nobody could sacrifice enough money, could sacrifice enough land, could sacrifice enough animals, could sacrifice enough humans, could sacrifice nothing that would take away the stench of sin off of our life, but Jesus Christ. And the greatest sacrifice that this world has ever known is the blood that flowed from Jesus Christ on the cross. It washed away sin then. It's not lost its power. It's still the only thing that can wash away sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to remember that. His blood has the same effect today as it did 2,000 years ago. I learned something a few months ago uh, when I was in uh, a doctor's office in Hendersonville, same one that me and Dickie go to. Uh, Brother Teddy's took me there. Been going there since Dr. Wesley had hair. <laughs> and it was black. It's what little bit he's got now is white as cotton. So we've become, and I just got a personal letter from him, so we've become somewhat of friends instead of just doctors. But They ought to have named him after another doctor that I've heard of, Dr. Cutright. <laughs> because Jana went out of here last Sunday with stitches. And she said, you can't guess where I've been. I did. But anyway, Dickie knows him as well as I do or better. He's worked on his equipment. But... He said, I'm going to give you quite a few antibiotics because he cuts so many places to keep the skin cancer down. 
and this is not in the message, but it maybe help you. He said, we've done experiments with this antibiotic. And he said, you can take what you have left, take what I want you to take. You'll be out of danger. Take the rest of it, put it in the freezer. And five years later, we took one out of the freezer and tested it, and it was as strong then as it was the day we put it in. Five years. He said, we haven't went beyond that with testing. But it's good for five years. As good as the day that you put it in. You know, I thought about the blood. It's been 2,000 years. But it's as good today as it was then. So thank the Lord for that. We are saved by the sacrifice of the blood. Salvation is extended by grace, not by feeling. And I can't help but think just across the road, I've mentioned it before, I made three or four trips over to a young couple's house. They visited one time. They left a note on their visitor's card and would love to see the pastor or have a visit. So I went. And that Thursday night after Sunday when I went, the first thing the lady said was, we didn't feel anything. You don't get saved by feeling. You get saved by faith. I'm not saying that you don't feel something. I knew in my heart when God spoke to me. Preacher Hollowfield told me one time when we, he said, get in my car. I want to take you to a revival. I did not know we were coming from Swannanoa all the way to Tennessee. Almost. We were way up in the mountains. Back in, you can't get there from here. A little country church. But he knew a woman that was going to preach. And he wanted me to go with him. So I went. And it's the first time I heard a woman preach. And as we were going back home, I don't know if it was a mindset I had. I don't know if it was my mind was already made up. And I, I agree with everything she said. But I was taught that women don't pastor and women don't preach. And going back through the mountains and going back towards Swannanoa late, I said, Brother Hollowfield, I said, I didn't feel anything. I didn't get anything. He pulled that Volkswagen over that he put 450,000 miles on that vehicle. Not with the same motor. <laughs> Long story behind that, but he pulled over, turned the inside light on, and he said, I need to tell you something. Because I was, I just brand new Christian. He said, you might sit in a whole lot of services and not feel anything. But I assure you that the Bible says God's Word doesn't return void. It's doing a work in somebody's life. It's speaking to somebody and if it's not speaking to you, then you need to pray God speak to the one you're speaking to. That helped me as much as anything I've heard. God's Word don't return void. It does a work. But we've got to believe it. Then I ended up pastoring a church where they had a woman pastor. Was it a woman pastor and her husband was the assistant? Yeah, I just asked Virginia. 
And that church is still thriving today. And her picture's in the library. And the pastor at Head's Church a few years ago told me he preached a revival there. And he said, I went in and looked at the pastor. And he said, I didn't know you pastored Davis Church. But I saw your picture in there. I said, I did. But so did that lady. And then the third thing that I want you to see that God left us is unlimited power. He tells us in Acts in 1.8. He tells us, and I'm not going to read it, you can, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That means when we get saved, we have more power than we realize. Some people in this church have told me I would witness more if I knew more. All you've got to do is get people to realize their loss. Ask them if they know that they'll go to heaven when they die. If they tell you no, they're not saved. Then you take the Word of God and go down the Romans road with them. And let the Word of God do the speaking. Let it teach them. I've got two or three suspects on my list that I want to go see, and I call them suspects till I talk to them the first time to see if they're ready. Then they become prospects. But God says we have unlimited power. Set a standard. For church, we need to have born again believers. Did you know? I know some churches. I more than more than a, probably than I realize. They'll just open the doors to anybody and everything. Today, if you want to join, we want you to get up and come forward, and we'll have a prayer with you and. You Become a member of the church. You don't know what you're bringing into your church when you do that. They need to be talked to. They need to be dealt with. They need to be prayed with. They need to give an account of their salvation experience before they become a member of the church. In some shape, form, or fashion, they've got to somehow convince you that they are a Christian. Or your church will be for all the pieces. Satan, if he can get his foot in the door, you can't shut the door. What follows? And sometimes it happens when we don't even know until it's too late. But we are to speak boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to read Revelation chapter 1, but... Uh, Come boldly to the throne of God. Come boldly to do His work. Remember Moses, who am I going to say sent me down there? I can't even talk plain. The king's not going to listen to me. Just tell the king I am sent you. He'll know who you're talking about. Yesterday I worked three hours or more on a sermon that I come up with the title, When I Die, They'll Know Who I Am. I Am. And I thought, well, that just won't fit tomorrow, and I didn't get through with it, but I worked a long time. I probably worked more yesterday than I can remember in a long time in one day. But I'm preaching another message that I worked on this morning. 
But listen to what he says. Speak boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. What did he say? He said, if you and I go out these doors and we get with our friends, our co-workers, our schoolmates, our neighbors, and we're ashamed to talk about Jesus Christ, he'll be ashamed of us. Folks, don't be ashamed to tell people you're a Christian. Amen. There was a family that sat right over here. If I mentioned their name, everybody here I think would know them. When that man got saved, his wife got upset and said, I've lived with him over 40 years and did not know he was lost. That caused me to wonder if she was saved. Because I think you can be around somebody for just a little while and tell if what's in their heart, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And you can't help but talk about somebody as great as Jesus is if you're saved. Paul said, can I tell you what happened to me on the road to Damascus? That's his testimony, and it goes on and on. Speak boldly. I got fired for talking about Jesus. Let me tell you. I got fired by the superintendent. Been there seven years. Nothing wrong with my work. But it put him under conviction so bad, he helped me get packed up and out the door. But I had six checks in my hand, my two weeks vacation, my two week notice, and two weeks labor. More money than I'd ever seen in my life. We hadn't been married long. Just had bought our first house. I thought I was more afraid of going in telling Regina that I'd got fired <laughs> than I was nervous over getting fired. <clears throat> but I stopped at Lewis O. Bartlett Plumbing Company on the way home. I thought I've been inside where I couldn't tell if it was raining or snowing or sunshine. No windows in that plant for seven years. I'm going to work outside if they'll hire me. Went in, told them the whole story. I was truthful with them. The secretary got up. She pointed at a man sitting in a corner at another desk. She said, you know Mr. Bartlett? And I said, never met him. If he walked in that door, I wouldn't know him. And he stood up and come around. She said, well, here he is. I stuck my hand out to shake hands. He hugged my neck. And he said, thank God he's answered my prayers. I've been praying. Send me some Christian men in here to work. How much was you making? I told him. He said, you just got a job and a dollar an hour raise to start with tomorrow morning. You think God don't take care of his people? Amen. But we got to tell him or they won't know it. That was a blessing. Then I told him I wanted to work at the church. I could work four ten-hour days and be off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or convert Friday to Monday. It didn't matter. And he put me with some of the worst people of course, I asked for it. He said in his office, I'm going to put you with this man that curses every breath. Let's get him saved. Only boss I ever had that said, if you don't get nothing done today, but get the witness to him, you'll still get your check. I drew 40 hours for the three or four years 
I worked with him, if I just worked two days, my check said 40 hours. God blesses his people. The fourth thing, Jesus left us with an unshakable testimony. That's the Word of God. If you put your faith and trust in what the Word says, it makes all the difference. It's sure prophecy. Joel's prophecy. If you've never read the book of Joel, you need to read it. And then the Bible is sharp as a two-edged sword. It cuts the hard hearts. And then sufficient for every need of the child of God. I believe just like I, I, I'm not a doctor, but I believe the cure to every disease is somewhere on the face of this earth. And I believe the answer to every sin problem is in this book. I believe the map that we need to follow is in here. But preacher, I don't understand it, probably because you don't read it. But if you keep reading and reading, it'll come to you. All we need is this book to give us the directions to heaven. Sufficient for all of our needs. What did he say? I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not meaning he'll supply all your wants, but he'll supply your needs. The text that I read to you is be unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. For you know your labor is not in vain. In the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 58. I hope and pray that you will remember that. Just like Lewis Bartlett told me, if you're witnessing for the Lord, be unmovable, always abounding. Your labor is not in vain. Only boss I ever had besides a church that paid me for witnessing for God. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. Brother Dickie dismisses, please. Dear Lord, we're thankful to come to your house today. We're thankful for the message you laid on Brother Ronnie's heart this morning. Lord, we just ask you to be with those that couldn't be here today and bless them and guide them and take care of them as only you can. Be with the people that we mentioned in the prayer list. Lord, you just take care of them. We'll pray for them, but we know you'll take care of them. Bless them and help them. Lord, be with us as we go about our ways on this busy weekend. Keep us safe and sound. And Lord, just let us keep your message in our heart and on our mind. We ask these and all things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. No church tonight. <clears throat>